I'm Bill Helmuth from HOK, and you're listening to U.S. Modernist Radio. Mama don't allow no architecture around here. Mama don't allow no architecture around here. Oh, I don't care what mama don't allow, gonna draw my modern anyhow. Mama don't allow no architecture around here. Welcome to U.S. Modernist Radio, where we talk and laugh with people who enjoy, own, create, dream about, preserve, love, and hate modernist architecture, the most exciting and controversial buildings in the world. I'm Tom Guild. Nowhere in the world celebrates modernism better than Modernism Week in Palm Springs, California. Every February, they have this architecture and design festival, which used to only be a week, but lately it's been supersized to last 11 days. U.S. Modernist Radio is there again this year, interviewing nearly all of Modernism Week's keynote speakers, plus special guests at the U.S. Modernist Compound, which is within the very cool confines of the Hotel Skylark. One of the most revered names in modernist architecture is Richard Neutra. From coast to coast, but mostly in California, Neutra's many modernist houses set the standard for open, comfortable living, bringing the outside in, reducing clutter, and maximizing every square foot of a house and its usually beautiful site. Today, George Smart talks with Richard Neutra's son, Raymond Neutra, about architecture, the passing of his brother Dion, and the future of Neutra Institute. Next, we'll chat with Catherine Myler, who brought a rundown Palm Springs Neutra House 20 years ago and brought it back to life after almost losing it to the elements. Finally, George talks with Ken Topper, part owner of the famous Level Health House in L.A., the place that brought Neutra to huge public fame back in 1929. For me, being back in Palm Springs for my second year meant that I had another chance to be a fly on the wall for lots of fascinating conversations with great designers, architects, and just plain interesting people for a whole week. You get to walk around the kinds of homes you usually only see in movies, with the added bonus that many of the homes were actually built for Hollywood actors and directors. So, like, if you've ever gone to an open house event down your street just to see how the neighbors fixed up their kitchen or redid the deck, Modernism Week is your vicarious thrill, times 10. Imagine, if you will, (laughs) that you're into NASCAR and you want to go to a NASCAR festival. Right. And you get there and there's not just cars in a convention center or a big racetrack with the cars zooming around, but there are cars... In every direction, as far as the eye can see, hundreds of them, maybe thousands of them. Right, right. That's how it is to go to Palm Springs and see all the mid-century modern houses. It's really incredible. You are in the milieu, as we say. (laughs) Yes, the milieu. For me, one highlight was our annual benefit at the Kirk Douglas House, which was designed by Donald Wexler. It has been meticulously restored by its new owners, Kirk Douglas sold the house a number of years ago, and he passed away this past year, and we had a special moment of silence in remembrance of Kirk at the party for that evening. If you want to go with us in February 2021 and stay at the U.S. Modernist Compound, email me at george at usmodernist.org. U.S. Modernist Radio is underwritten by nichiha.com slash usmodernist and by Modernist realtor Angela Roll. In her ongoing imaginary life, modernist realtor Angela Roll supported herself from the age of 12 through black market carpentry and off the books house flipping, roaming the streets of Los Angeles with a nail gun and a Home Depot gift card of questionable origin. She rose to fame as a modernist renovator while keeping a 4-2 average and dating Jordan Catalano on the side. My so-called life. After high school graduation following a wild night involving goat cheese, crystal, an inflatable kiddie pool, Sunset Boulevard, and a SWAT team, <laughs> Angela was recruited to study architecture at SciArc on a full boat scholarship. Amazingly, she declined and instead followed a different Catalano, architect Eduardo, into Boston, 
After studying at MIT, spending years in nutrient and sleep deprived architecture studios, tortured with balsa wood and styrofoam, rarely seeing the light of day, she moved to North Carolina and became one of the top modernist real estate agents. With specialized design training and her trusty nail gun, she advises buyers and sellers of modernist houses on everything from appropriate pricing to how to talk to a SWAT team. Very useful. Yeah, one member at a time. Angela Roll is your special agent. Reach her at AngelaRoll.com, that's R-O-E-H-L, or 919-995-0550. Thank you, Tom. Raymond Neutra and his brother Dion, sons of architect Richard Neutra, have been friends of our show for many years. Dion, who was also an architect, passed away last year in his 90s, having overseen the Neutra legacy through the Neutra Institute for decades. Dion came into architecture through working with his father for about 15 years until the senior Neutra died of a heart attack in 1970. Raymond took a different path, epidemiology, a timely field right now. Yeah. Although he's retired from that and now leads the Neutra Institute since Dion's passing. At 2019's Modernism Week, I interviewed Dion about his own legacy, separate from his famous father, which you can listen to in our back catalog. Let's go poolside to visit with Raymond Neutra at the U.S. Modernist Compound in Palm Springs. Raymond, it was, it was about a year ago I was sitting right here talking with Dion. And it was one of the nicest conversations I think I ever had with him because I decided in the interview just to talk about Dion ah, uh -huh. and Dion's life and Dion's projects, not really hardly a mention of his dad. And it was a totally different experience than uh, when I talked to him yes. about other projects. Right. We talked about the Huntington a lot. Yes. He really loved that. And it was sad to hear about his loss recently. So my condolences to go to you and your family. Well, thank you. He had a very rough ending. Um, and so he was really willing and ready to go. But families rallied around him and he had a lot of support. And the day before he died, he called me up and tearfully said he was ready to go. But thank me for all the help I'd been giving him over the last couple of months, and he did that with each of his kids. So it was very oh. sweet. Yeah. And his wife? His wife is also in hospice care and is at their home. Okay. With 24-7 care. And um, I knew she was very sick as well. Yeah. We were in touch with her. I FaceTime with her a couple of times a week, and, and she's being well cared for there. You and I were talking yesterday about the fact that in the last couple of generations anyway, most people know Neutra through the buildings, through the houses, and through the preservation movement itself. And we're all scrambling to make sure that there's not another uh, great Maslon debacle in Palm Springs where something gets torn down in the middle of the night. But your dad's work was really much more than just architecture. It was about the future. It was about being better people, being better communities. So talk to me a little bit about that and how the Neutra Institute is going to be working to bring that side of your dad's legacy out again. Yeah, thanks for asking that. It's a challenge for us. My brother Dion left a sizable amount of securities in three Neutra buildings in the Silver Lake District, which are part of what's called the Neutra Colony, 11 Neutra buildings all within two blocks of each other. The earliest one is the garden wing of the VDL, which was built when I was born in 1939. And the last one is 1967. So you have a 30-year span of Neutra designs. And interestingly, there are, if you like, villas in the area, but there are also in these buildings that we've uh, now in charge of are apartments. And apartments were the very first American project that my dad did with a jardinette uh, garden apartment. Oh, yes. Very famous. So that this was a concern for him about how you could live close to nature, even if you were in the second story or first story of, of an apartment building. And so we have examples of those. Now, of course, we want to preserve those. 
And I think yesterday you and I were talking and I was saying, well, the attitude toward preserving Abe Lincoln's log cabin is different from, let's say, the attitude to preserving the Auschwitz camp. Yeah. That is that some things have a lesson for the future and some things are just interesting per se as, as their own thing. We want to keep the Giza pyramid there, but not because we want to build more pyramids or there's, you know, it's just something that we want to know about the past. So we're committed to preserving the buildings that we have and their interesting apartments. Each of them have apartments on them, which is good news because that means we have income to keep the entire buildings preserved. There's the Neutra Alexander office, which my brother Dion had been using as a museum space. And there have been about a thousand artists that have shown in that space in the last three years. Uh, but in the back of the building, there are two beautiful apartments. And so that's supporting that building. And then the treetops apartments are just apartments. And uh, then his own home has a studio apartment above the garage. It's a little gem. So the issue is what were the enduring human needs that my dad was trying to, and Dion too, were trying to call out and pay attention to that are always going to be human needs? And how were they solved in the 19, from the 1940s through the 80s, really, with Dion's work? And how are we going to respond to those same needs when the nighttime temperature in L.A. is 120 degrees in another 30, 40 years? Right. Um, it's not going to be the same technology. It's not going to be the same solution, but the same needs need to be addressed. And so how can we program the buildings so that when people are thinking about the needs that we can guide them to think, okay, how are we going to address this going forward in the climate crisis? And how are people with special needs accommodated in places? Because a lot more of us are going to be living in apartments. We have this terrible housing shortage in, in California. So more of us will live in apartments, but how can we make them delightful places to be in, even in changed circumstances and changed technologies. And I think that's something that people don't think about when they look at my dad's houses. They just know that they respond to them without knowing what my dad was noticing about people like them and what they needed. And that's why they have the effect that they do. There's a huge interest now among readers of Dwell and Curbed and Dezine and other publications in the general field of urban planning and how to not only link all the different infrastructure systems together and deal with the housing crisis, which is, I think, in almost every major city right now, but also about how to really look at the ongoing quality of life that people can have and how architecture can affect that and how architecture can also be a part of not just being a shelter, but really adding to someone's life. Absolutely, and that's, that's why the vision, the target, if you like, of the Neutra Institute of Survival Through Design is surviving in the climate crisis through well-researched designs that serve humanity and serve the planet. Hmm. And if we can have more of those kinds of designs and design processes, in which we involve people that are affected by design in the design process to make sure that their needs are satisfied, that would be a good thing. And so the preservation part of it is to preserve what we have in a way that gets people to have more insight about the needs and how they need to be responded to. And then the other part is to assist those who are interested in researching about this stuff and people who have been exemplary in applying those insights to responsible designs. And we use the word design advisedly because it's not just architecture and city planning. It can even be designed of software. If you just look at what the smartphone and the internet has affected our lives in some good ways, but some unintended and surprising bad ways, 
we want to work with people that care about those things and find ways to celebrate and get the word out. And so that's why I'm so delighted that you're letting me bend your ear here. Well, let's talk about getting the word out. You're an epidemiologist by training. That's right. Right? Mm -hmm. So you're all about the spread of infections and how to contain them. And also about getting people to do stuff they don't want to do. Right. So (laughs) how do you create an epidemic of interest in this survival through design in the Institute? I mean, we can all applaud the loftiness of the nobility of the goals, right? Right. I think everyone agrees on a conceptual basis. But how do you sort of positively infect people with this desire to actually get involved and pay attention to it? You know, it's interesting. There's a fellow that wrote a book some years ago called The Adoption of Technical Innovation, which he used an epidemiology model. He, He was an agricultural guy, and he noticed that there were a few forward-looking people that are willing to try a new agricultural technique. And then there was another group that were the early adopters. And then when you got up to a certain percentage, suddenly it exponentially took hold. So I don't have the answer right now, but you try to think of who influences what gets built in the world. Well, they're individual home builders, but that's a very small fraction of what gets built, right? Yeah. It's contractors and developers and people like that that make a decision. And I was interested that the Alexander Company that built a lot of the buildings around here in Palm Springs. Yes. Apparently, the dad built traditional tract homes, and then his son got together with Bill Kreisel. Yes. And said, Dad, let us, just let us try. Experiment with a couple of these. Let just, ah, come on, they'll never sell. No, just let us try, Dad. We think we can do it. And they did it, and apparently it was less expensive than what he was doing, and it sold like hotcakes. And so then he was willing to do it, but it took the contact of his son, infected by Bill Kreisel, to uh, make the change. And then, at least here in Palm Springs, there were a lot of those kinds of uh, developments, not so much elsewhere. And the Eichler homes, just just Eichler was an early adopter. Apparently he lived in a Frank Lloyd Wright house or something like that. Right. And except for an investment in some multi-story apartments that then went belly up, he would have continued to be successful and it might have taken over more. I, I'm interested in the sociology of the people that were willing to do this to start with as opposed to the sociology of the people that want to buy an Eichler home now. It's a different phenomenon, maybe even somewhat for a different motivation. I'm not sure if anyone has has studied that well, but as an epidemiologist, we try to understand that to try to get people to stop smoking eat more healthily, practice safe sex, yes. and all, those, all that, all that all stuff that, that, that they don't want to do. Yeah. Um, wash their hands, right? Wash their hands, yeah, which we've got to do now. I mean, I don't know if this is true. Maybe you can tell me. But I keep reading from different sources that essentially hand washing is the most revolutionary public health behavior there is. It's true. It, it's amazing how much uh, just that simple gesture. Just, to, just I was just thinking of talking about technology. So we're used to running water, and we waste a lot of water because it's so easy for us. But the fact that we had that and that we train our children to wash their hands has had an amazing effect, mm-hmm. particularly on gastrointestinal spread disease, yes. which used to be rampant with typhoid and and um well having gotten norovirus on a cruise ship i know all about how this thing works yeah (laughs) wow Uh, that was not a fun time right you know there's this whole interest in the microbiome and Mm -hmm. that there's some possibility that we've traded some terrible infectious diseases with some more autoimmune diseases because we're not challenged enough yeah and that may be something that we'll research about the optimum environment to balance that out. Now, how can people get in touch with the Neutra Institute as you guys 
build for the next couple of years? Well, right now, the best thing is just to email me, which okay. is easy, RaymondNoitra at gmail.com. No okay. capitals, no dots, Raymond Neutra, N-E-U-T-R-A, at gmail.com. And we'll probably get more sophisticated. We're, we're in early days now. We have a lot of administrative stuff to do, and we're just doing a few things now to get started to give people a hint of the kind of things we're interested mm-hmm. in. In preserving the Neutra legacy in a way to be stimulating, there are buildings, three of which we have control over and others which we can advise on. There are archives at... UCLA and uh, Cal Poly, and also at uh, Cornell, where Robert Alexander kept all the Neutra Alexander commercial buildings, schools, Mm -hmm. campus colleges, and and, an embassy, and things like that. We're trying to get the curators of those to cost out what it would take to have a really good finding aids on all of those and to coordinate them so that it makes it easier for scholars. It makes easier for those who newly own some of these structures right. how to responsibly restore them. And it, the, is the website that Dion put together over the years still going? Yeah, and we're modifying that. It was pretty heavy on his firm, which is now closed. Right. So we're not going to be offering any architectural consultation. But what's uh, the URL for that? Because I know it has a lot of great... Yes, it has a lot of good things on it, Neutra.org. Neutra, okay, Neutra.org. And we're going to mirror what you already are doing with the list of all the projects, yes. including the commercial ones, not good. just the residential good. ones. And we'll try to have pictures where we do. And we need to figure out how to link between your yes. archive and, and ours. We're going to link to a website that I set up on the social history of the Neutra VDL studio residence, talking okay. about some of the more interesting clients that were interviewed there, talking about the extended family that lived there, some of the people who worked there and, and, and their further careers and so forth. And uh, that website is one of our projects that we're working on now. Then uh, we're reissuing Survival Through Design, and Barbara Lamprecht is going to do a scholarly foreword okay. in interpreting some of the chapters and how they relate to things that are going on now in neuroscience and architecture. Well, anything we can do to help out, please let us know, because we want to support the Neutra legacy for buildings and for urban design and planning and building a better future. Great. Thank Thank you. you, Raymond. It's always a pleasure. Likewise. Take care. That was George Smart with Raymond Neutra. And now, a moment of reflection from Nietzsche Ha. Catherine Myler is a location scout. That's someone who gets hired by a TV, movie, 
print, or commercial production looking for a cool place to film. She scours Los Angeles and the surrounding area to match the right location to the cast, story, and vibe of each production. She also owns the Grace Miller House, one of two Richard Neutra houses in Palm Springs. Let's go now to Modernism Week Poolside with Catherine Myler. Catherine, I am so delighted this is your first podcast and you're choosing to spend it with me. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for asking. I'm delighted to be here. You are a scout for locations, right? Is that the way to No, phrase not it? technically. I, I have a library of locations that I represent. Okay, you're like an agent for locations? Exactly. Okay. Yes. So, like, people, actors have agents, people have agents, houses have agents. Oh, okay. So, I'm a house agent. So, a production would call you up and say, hey, like a casting director, really. Exactly. Exactly. And say, what kind of house do you have for this particular kind of film? Yes, they'll email me a brief, give me a call, chat it through and say, we're looking for this specific type of house. They'll tell me a little bit about the character that mm -hmm. lives there, about the scenes that they plan to film there, whether it's going to be interior, exterior, that sort of thing. And give me a general idea of what they're looking for, and then they'll leave it to me to come up with some ideas for them. Are most of the requests that you get Short-term kind of things, like we're going to come for a day or two and shoot a commercial or shoot a series of photographs, or is it where we need to tie up a house for three months? Mostly commercials are usually a day, possibly two days. Uh, TV shows are more likely to be a little bit longer, like a week, because mm -hmm. they might come in and make some quite severe changes to the property which is the prep days, and then they'll do shoot days, and then they'll do strike days, which is when they come in and put it all back together Put it again. all back together. And then TV shows and movies tend not to work on weekends because they're unionized. So if we're shooting at a house over the weekend, we have what we call hold days, where everything is left in place. The homeowner is usually paid to stay in a hotel or an Airbnb. And the crew just walks away on a Friday and comes back on Monday. So how do you get clients? Are your clients the houses that, that have you be their agent or are your clients the productions or is it both? It's both. I mean, I'm literally the middle person and I have to work just as hard for one as for the other mm. because, yes, I'm representing the home. So they're really my number one client because I have to look after them and make sure that Everything in the contract is fair for both sides. But then the production company is also my client. So I have to make sure that they can do what they want to do. So the hardest part of my job is really to make sure going into the project that expectations on both sides are completely reviewed and accurate. So there's never any surprises on the day. Right, because you don't want that. No. I mean, the last thing you need is somebody turning up with a tiger <laughs> and saying, Has that oh, happened? I'm here with the tiger. <laughs> yes, it has happened. And everyone's looking at each other saying, what tiger would that be? <laughs> and when it did happen, luckily, it was, it was half a dozen cubs. Yeah. But we had not been told. And Half we, a dozen tiger cubs? Yeah, because they have to rotate them through. So if one's feeling a bit grumpy. Oh, right. They have a happier one, hopefully. That's like the they, three lassies they had, exactly, right, for exactly. that production. Yeah. Okay. So, um, you know, with that sort of thing, you have to make sure they've had their shots and that the owner doesn't have pets that might not be happy <laughs> about a, a tiger arriving. Or yeah, six of them. Yes, there's, so there's all these things you have to suddenly consider, and that's uh -huh. why it's a really good idea to get those sort of things sorted out prior to the day. Now, how do you deal with neighbors? Do neighbors get upset about these things? Yes, that's really out of our realm. Okay. That's the production company's area. Okay. Um, we usually encourage the houses that we represent to keep in close touch with their neighbors and let them know what's going on and what's coming. And also a basket or a bottle of wine afterwards if it was a night shoot or if it was particularly intrusive on the area. Or if the tiger's got loose. The tiger's got loose. 
<laughs> Here's your bottle of wine, Ele- Chad. <laughs> elephants rampaging down the road. <laughs> yeah, that's that's usually that's left to the production company and the homeowner. Okay, it's not us. Give me some examples of some of the shows that you provided houses for. Well, the longest one we did was actually a three-month booking. And okay. that was the Neutra Singleton House on Mulholland mm-hmm. that was then owned by Vidal Sassoon. Oh, yes. Uh-huh. And it was for an Eddie Murphy movie called A Thousand Days. And every time he told an untruth, maybe it was A Thousand Leaves, a leaf fell off a tree, so we had to put a fake tree in the garden. So we went in for a month and completely changed the house from a Neutra house to a sort of pretty house with curtains. Uh-huh. And that took a month. And then they, f- they filmed there for a month, and then it took a month to put it all back together again. Okay. And it had only just been restored by Vidal's wife. Rhonda. Rhonda. And she was about to put it on the market. So when I suggested to them that this could be an option, I suggested that we bring in the contractor who had done all the work and have him walk through the house with us and we could tell him what we wanted to do and he could say, yes, you can do that, no, you can't do that. And that's what we did. And we also had a huge lighting rig on the roof because there was a lot of night work. So we had the roofing contractor who had redone the roof come over and walk through with us and tell us how much weight we could put on, where it could be done, all that sort of thing. So the house was very, very well looked after during the process. And that was, that was a three-month booking. That was the longest one I'd ever done. I don't remember the Eddie Murphy film. That must not have really hit the box office. I think, sadly, it didn't. We were all terribly <laughs> excited, and then it sort of faded away. All that work. <laughs> yes. I know that on Modern Family, there's a modernist house that they show an outside clip of mm-hmm. every time. It's been going on for 10 years. Is that one of yours? No. No, okay. No, we have done houses here and there for Modern Family mm-hmm. because one of the characters is a real estate agent. So oh, right. always looking for a certain kind of house that he will sell. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> we did a few Mad Men episodes, Ray Donovan. Mm-hmm. So do the owners of these houses that, that lend themselves to productions, mm-hmm. do they come and find you and say, hey, I'd like you to rep my house? Yes. Okay. Um, earlier on when I first opened the company, I would do more chasing of houses because we needed the inventory. But now, 20 years later, we have a certain name in the business that's known for professionalism and looking after houses, which is really important. So people recommend us, directors will recommend us, producers will recommend us for their own friends, which is a very high recommendation to get. Right. Um, And then homeowners that we represent tell their friends as well. So it comes from both sides, which is good. And, And you've had this business for how long now? 20 years. 20 years. Okay. That was what? 1999. 1999. And then in 2000, I believe that's correct, year, something else happened in your life. (laughs) And you became a homeowner (laughs) of one of these spectacular houses. Tell us about that. Um, It was a very rash decision um, to buy a Neutra crack den in Palm Springs. One of his specialty homes. (laughs) They were very rare. (laughs) But there was this one, and I knew it was there. I had sort of been told about it and and walked around it. You could walk around it in those days. And I'd inherited some money and wanted to buy a property and couldn't really find anything I was crazy about in L.A. And I suddenly realized that that Neutra crack den hadn't really been changed in the year since somebody had bought it with the idea of restoring it. So I just called him and said, are you still interested in the house or do you want to sell it? Because I'm very interested in buying it. And he was over the moon. I'm sure if it was a crack (laughs) den, he would love to sell it. (laughs) So I bought it um, and spent a year getting it to code, Mm -hmm. taking off the crack den, building a wall around it because the crack addicts would keep coming back. Right. It was a noted crack house. Yes. Yes. (laughs) One of the few architecturally significant (laughs) crack houses available, I would assume, (laughs) for the connoisseur. Exactly. There was a certain level of crack (laughs) addict. And I've been restoring it ever since. It's beautiful. I've been inside it. You've been very gracious to let us look through it. And it's not just one building. There's multiple buildings on the property. It's the original house... And on the west side, the back side of the house, was a carport. 
But originally, the owner could drive in from that back area. Mm -hmm. But over the years, all that land was sold off. So when I bought the house, I had to drive down the side of the house and around into the carport, which meant that I couldn't put all the original landscaping back in again. Mm. So a few years ago, I built a carport at the street and then changed the garage to be a sort of utility room, a sort of millennial room, really, where you can have a big fridge and freezer and washing and dryer and dishwasher and such. And storage. That's where you stick your millennials? I mean, I... <laughs> <laughs> That's where you have everything in this millennial period. Oh, I see. Okay. That if you wanted in a 1930s house, you'd have to vastly change the footprint. All right. So that's where all the modem and that sort of thing, storage, goes. Yeah. And then... The house was built in 1937. In 1938, Mrs. Miller decided that she wanted as another room built on, a sort of self-contained room for her two sons. So Neutra designed it and did some elevations. And then she changed her mind and didn't proceed with it. But when I was given a set of the plans, the plans, the elevations for the, for the guest house were there. So I built it. So that's on also on the back, on the west side. Yeah. So that's a completely self-contained room with its own bathroom, a kitchenette, a little seating area, overlooks the pool and the orchard and is now available on Airbnb. Yes, you can stay there. You can stay there. Which is delightful. That's yeah. a fairly new development, right? Yes. I've had one guest so far who was an architect who was delighted. And I'm sure. She was thrilled to be there. She left a lovely review. I was very happy and so she'd be The back. crack people come back and want to revisit, <laughs> you know, now that they've rehabbed. <laughs> they wouldn't recognize it. <laughs> it's not what it used to be. No, no it really isn't. So... Are you a stage mother now for this house in terms of has any production been shot there yet? No. No? No. Okay. Because when people come to Palm Springs to film, they usually want a certain Palm Springs sort of typical 50s experience. And mm -hmm. the house is really much more 30s. As you know, it's much darker inside. Yes. A lot of the houses that people like to shoot here are very white, terrazzo floor inside. Um, palm trees. It doesn't have any palm trees. It's, it's more early so, modern than the typical yeah. Palm Springs yes, modern absolutely, involved with that. Yeah. Well, it's certainly an incredible job that you did because that 30s construction and combined with the heat of the desert and various, you know, crack addicts coming through, I mean, it's very delicate mm -hmm. in that house. Mm -hmm. It's not something you can just hammer about and make things no. fixed, can you? No, no it is very delicate. For, for a Neutra house, it's a very feminine house, mm -hmm. I think. And it is, it takes a certain amount of care to look after it. And the elements are not kind. So the maintenance is, is high and constant. Yes. And the yard is huge, as you know. And that's been worked on a lot over the past couple of years. I've put the orchard back in again, mm -hmm. which is nice. The trees have grown up. And that does shade the house a little bit. That helps with the maintenance. But it does take some some looking after but it's well, worth it if people want to stay in the Airbnb mm -hmm. part of this how can they get in touch with you um, they can go to www.gracemillerhouse.com okay and that shows some photographs of the whole property including the guest house not the main house right and then there's a, a link there to Airbnb to Airbnb okay yeah. Well, Catherine, thanks so much for coming by. It's such Thank a pleasure. You. Thank you for having me. How did you me. enjoy your first podcast? <laughs> so far, so good. <laughs> so good? Okay. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank I, you. Thank you very much. That was George Smart chatting with Neutra owner, Catherine Myler. When Richard Neutra's Lovell Health House debuted in 1929, over 10,000 people trekked up the hills to Dundee Drive to see this marvel of modernist design. Almost 100 years later, it's still a marvel, and for the first time in 60 years, it's for sale. I visited with past podcast guest Ken Topper, co-owner and current resident in the Lovell House, to get an update on the future of this iconic destination. Ken, thanks for coming back by and visiting with me. Always a pleasure, George. You know, your house is one of the, the few that I try to follow like week by week or month by month about what's been happening there. First of all, I really want to give you our condolences on your mom, who passed away last year. Yeah, thank you. Uh, one day before my birthday. 
Yeah. I mean, she was she was a great lady and was such a steward of that house over so many years, 60 years? Uh, yeah, approximately 60. And since then, the house has transformed in a way is it's much more engaging now with the public. So what are some of the things that are happening over there? Well, some of the things are that it's actually a curated house now. Uh, we actually have complete Neutra furniture in there, courtesy of VS America, in addition to some of the pieces that my parents made under the direction of Neutra. And it's set up so that you can actually see all of those clean lines. You can actually experience it much more in the way that I know Neutra wanted you to see it because I, when he came when I was a kid, it looks the way he tried to make it when he was there. Well, that's great. And people can tour it now. Absolutely. Uh, we encourage people to come on Saturdays. We are open uh, every Saturday starting at noon and the last two are at three. So tours are on the hour from noon to three. Uh, entry is $50 cash, $60 with a credit card. Tours will last almost an hour and you get Josh Garrell, the Neutra expert who tours you around the house, gives you everything you could ever want to know and then some. And then occasionally I'll also join in with those people out at the garage and add in my experiences or just answer questions for them. So far we've been seeing that people are really enjoying it and uh, posting a lot of photos on uh, Instagram. Since you've opened up for tours, about how many people have come through? Josh likes to hold up the stack. We as Each person has to sign a waiver as they come through the door, and we're well over 1,000. Oh, that's fabulous. And although this generates a lot of money, you have some pretty incredible expenses in keeping this house alive, don't you? Well, this is actually how Josh and I make our living. Okay. The money's going to us because we need to keep the house open, and this is how we can do it. Uh, us being there, we need to pay ourselves. And when people visit, they really need to come on Uber or Lyft or something, right? Because there's no parking, essentially, up there. Uh, Saturdays is usually not too bad, but when we do events where we know 40 people are descending there at the same time, we do insist they do Uber, Lyft. It is suggested, though, because you never know how much parking will be available. It's, it's very, very limited and because and, you're up in the hills. We are at the top of a cul-de-sac. So everything is down. <laughs> everything is down once you're up at the topper house. Now, mm -hmm. you have talked about the future of the house and the possibility of selling it. What's happening on that front? Uh, well, effective uh, a couple of days ago, we entered into a 90-day contract uh, with Heritage Auctions for them to begin to market the house uh, in conjunction with the agency, which is a Beverly Hills-based okay. real estate firm. So it'll be a public auction? No. Currently, it's a 90-day window for them to uh, try to bring buyers through and uh, let them look and make offers if they so choose. Okay, so is the house listed for sale? It's listed in terms of being with Heritage Auctions. Okay. But it's not on the MLS. I'm, I'm confused. I don't know how this works. I mean, I know what an auction is, and I know what being on MLS is. We're but, in the middle. Yeah, <laughs> we're, somewhere. We're right in the middle. And so, uh, you know, certainly the Lovell Health House is known for being unusual. Yeah. So I guess I don't consider this necessarily unusual. This is a very special house. And we're trying to figure out the best way to understand what it's worth. Is the goal here just to force the buyers to give you a number instead of no, having yeah, a price? I, well, you know, uh, force is a bad word. Well, not, well just, I mean, it, it, the, the mechanism does put the responsibility on the buyers to say, here's what I want to well, offer. Well, it does, yes. Okay. So in typical sales, you say what the price is, and then people have to either do that or, or bid it up. How come you didn't go that way? Because we honestly don't have a number. Okay. It's hard to appraise the house? Well, it's hard to appraise it in terms of what other people think it's worth. I mean, whenever I'm asked, what is it worth? It's what's worth somebody else will pay for it. If you look at it strictly under a real estate appraisal, mm -hmm. it's one number. If you look at it with an intrinsic value attached to it, that's a very subjective type of thing. Okay. So it's... Are there any current easements on the house that protect it from demolition no. or no, well, renovation? It, it has an L.A. City cultural landmark status, okay, which I believe prevents altering the face of the house, but it doesn't protect anything interior-wise. But uh, 
I believe anybody that would want to do anything there would certainly come under great public protest were they to try to change it in any way. But our goal here is to find buyer or entity whose goal is to keep it running as Josh and I are doing it now, almost as a public trust, where we're open all the time. We're open to all types of events, and we're also open to students and their classes. So we want to be more of a cultural and educational arts center. So you're doing public tours on the weekends and these other kinds of groups during the week? Yes. And we also do private events. We just did a a major product announcement from a skincare brand called La Prairie. Okay. (laughs) Incidentally, La Prairie is making a donation to the Neutra Institute, which wants to use that money to attain monument status for the house. And does that come with any strong protections? No, but what it does is it actually makes it much more available to restoration of funding. Okay. And okay. also to tax benefits. Do you expect that you will get people through heritage auctions that will come and want to preserve the house? Or uh, how, well, do the, they, how do they screen for that? Well, yeah, I mean, that's our screening process in terms of once, once they're already there. Their screening process is to know whether they have the capability to buy the house. Just the cash. Do they, it, they have enough cash right, to do it? right. Just for our listeners to get a sense of scale, I mean, what ballpark are we talking about? Is this a $20 million house or a $50 million house? I mean, where is it in that scale? Well, I think all I'm going to say is that there's an eight-figure offer on it. Okay. Well, that's good. And so through this process, you're hoping you'll get more offers to be able to compare? Of course. Of course. Uh, I I think we received an offer unsolicited. Mm -hmm. And so being, uh, you know, a family of five everybody's interested in like we didn't we didn't do anything to generate that let's see what happens if we actually somehow start letting the people know you know the clock is running now and and something is going to happen auction or this process that we're in right now with 90 days okay and this family that you mentioned these are your brothers and sisters they are okay yes but you're just the only one living in the house along with josh right that's now, correct right, right. Yes. okay Josh Garrell, uh, who's been a guest on our show, has a great Instagram feed. He sends out dozens, if not hundreds, of photos of different angles of the house that you can go and look up. Yeah, he, he amazes me sometimes with what he comes up with. But interestingly enough, I'm seeing, since we've had so many people coming through, and they are posting on their own Instagram pages. Mm-hmm. And if you do a hashtag Lovell House search... You're going to see some pretty amazing uh, photos. It's making me see the house completely different ways than I've ever seen it. And so I really appreciate, you know, what people are doing. I assume now that with the house being more open, there's going to be a tremendous just resurgence of interest, not only in that building, but in Neutra in general. And we've had the passing of Dion Neutra, uh, his son recently. So there's a lot more on people's minds these days about Neutra buildings. We certainly hope so, and we want to work in conjunction with Raymond Neutra, who's taken charge of the Neutra Institute, because we believe it's uh, in everybody's interest that owns a Neutra house uh, for what we do at the Lovell House, and we definitely want to promote the legacy of Richard Neutra. We'll be looking forward to seeing what kind of bids come in on the house and who the next steward of the Lovell House is going to be. And thank you so much, Ken, for coming by and giving us an update. Well, it's always a pleasure, George. And uh, maybe the next one we'll be able to give you that actual number. All right. Thanks. Okay, Bye-bye. George. Thanks. That was Ken Topper in February, not telling George Smart the price of the house. However, as of August 14th, it was listed for sale by Crosby Doe, the Obi-Wan Kenobi of modernist real estate agents for $11.5 million. May the force be with you, Crosby, to find this iconic Richard Neutra house, its next caring steward. Thanks for listening. Stay tuned as we bring more shows from 2020's Modernism Week in Palm Springs. If you want to hang out with us at the swanky U.S. Modernist Compound at Modernism Week next year, February 2021, just email george at usmodernist.org. U.S. Modernist Radio is underwritten by nichiha.com slash usmodernist and by Angela Roll. 
Your special agent for modernist houses, 919-995-0550. Okay, George, it's your turn. Visit usmodernist.org's massive archives to listen to past shows, discover documentation on now 7,500 significant modernist houses, and access 3 million pages of classic 20th century architecture magazines. U.S. Modernist Radio is produced by Soundtracks Recording Studio in Raleigh, North Carolina. Our theme song was performed by me and Robinson Earl. Carrie Cesarino researches guests while juggling two children, a bowling ball, a candle, and a chainsaw, (laughs) all while salsa dancing with husband Adam. U.S. Modernist Radio is a production of Modernist Archive, a nonprofit educational archive for the documentation, preservation, and promotion of modernist residential design. I'm George Smart, and as the summer winds die down, I recall the cool, magical nights we spend each year at Modernism Week, sometimes at Frank Sinatra's pool in Palm Springs. We'll be back soon with another I Get a Kick Out of You, Pocket Full of Miracles, for Once in My Life edition of U.S. Marnish Radio. Cheers. Skull. Skull.